Good morning and welcome to Legacy Baptist Church. So glad that you're able to join us today. And we just look forward to the service that the Lord has for us today. And as we begin the service this morning, I'm going to be reading from Psalm 108 today. If you'd like to join me there, Psalm 108. And I'll be reading verses 3 to 5. And the Bible says, I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. And I will sing praises unto the unto thee among the nations, for thy mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reaches unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and thy glory above all the earth. And this morning, as we focus on the Lord and uh, prepare our hearts for the service today, I hope we just realize uh, the majesty of the Lord that we serve, and that he rules among the nations, but he rules above the earth as well. And this morning, as we consider that, we consider us before the Lord that he cares for even each and every one of us. As he rules all the nations, he cares for each and every one who is here today. So let's pray as we begin the service today. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so grateful to be in your house today. And Lord, we're grateful that you rule above all the earth. And yet still in your love, you would send your son to die for each and every one of us, Lord. And we're grateful for that. And Lord, as we uh, come to you this morning and we look forward to worshiping together we pray that all that is said and done today would glorify you but more importantly lord i pray that you'd speak to our hearts today prepare the hearts of everyone who is here i pray that your spirit would work and speak to every heart according to the needs that are there lord and i pray that if there's one who is here today that has never accepted you as lord and savior that they don't realize the hope that is found in you that today they place their hope in you call upon your name and be saved and we pray these things in your son's holy and precious name amen
all stand up, please. And let's sing, Brethren, we have met to worship. On the first. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Brethren, see poor sinners round you slumbering on the brink of woe. Death is coming, hell is moving, can you bear to let them go? See our fathers and our mothers and our children sinking down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered on the last. Let us love our God supremely, let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God will thanks you. Then he'll call us home to heaven, at his table we'll sit down. Christ will care to himself. All around, amen. Remain standing and let's sing across the land. On the first, you're the word of God, of Father, from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation hold together by the power of your, your hand. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the land. Yet Come to seek and save the lost And exchange the joy of heaven For the anguish of a poor With a prayer you pair the hungry With a word you still the sea Yet how silently That the guilty may go free You're the author of creation You're the Lord your cry rings out across the land on the last. With a shout, you grow victorious, wrestling victory from the grave. As ascended into heaven, leading captives in your wake. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for own. From each tribe and tongue and nation, you are leading sinners home. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord. And your cry of love rings out across the land. Amen. Great singing. Please be seated. Well, we're well into June or getting into it, and the swing of the busyness of the summer is coming along. So uh, just a few announcements with what's coming up in ju uh, June and the beginning of July. So this Saturday is our core bowling. So anyone ages uh, between, if you're in your 30s and 40s, that's our new ministry uh, f uh, for that. So if you are planning to go bowling, which is at Rexdale Bowlerama, please sign up for that. Uh, you can pay ahead, but please sign up so we can make the arrangements this week as we book the lanes. Uh, so anyone in their 30s and 40s would love to see you there. And then next Sunday is Father's Day. I don't have a, a thing on the slide for that, but next 
uh, Sunday is Father's Day, so celebrating dads, and there will be a gift for every father who is with us. And then on Sunday, June 23rd, one of the highlights of the year is our ranch day. Uh, so just putting it out there, there is no service here at the church on uh, June 23rd. We'll be meeting at Rocky Ridge Ranch, uh, which is just outside of Milton. So the directions and address, that's all on the website. All the information I'm giving you now, you can find on the church website as, lo as well as sign up uh, can be found there. But we'll be starting our service there at 1030. But it's a great day. Um, dress is casual. Uh, there will be hot dogs and hamburgers, so you can sign up for those on the church website. And then many people bring their lunch as well. So make sure to bring your lawn chair. Uh, there will be no live stream as well. We've tried in the past, but there's just no reception out there. Uh, but then afterwards, there will be activities. Uh, there's sports. Uh, there's swimming. And then there's pony rides for kids 11 or, I believe, 10 and under. And there's a cost for $15 for that. But like I said, go to the church website and please do sign up. You do need to be signed up by next Sunday. Uh, just put your name and how many people are coming and then the amount of hot dogs or hamburgers that you'd like. And that way we can just make the preparations for that day. So we look forward to seeing you there. And as I mentioned last week, if you're maybe new to the church, you've never been before, everyone is welcome. We would love to see everyone who is here today at the ranch. And uh, if you need help with signing up or maybe you would like to be uh, would like to go to Ranch Day, but you don't have a way of getting there, let myself know, and we can see if we can make arrangements uh, for that. And then on Ju Saturday, uh, sorry, June uh, 29th, which is a Saturday, is our community day, and uh, we look forward to that day because it's a way to reach our community. So we'll be having a church yard sale. Sorry, when I say church yard sale, I mean we're having a yard sale, but uh, individuals can set up table and sell your own goods, and uh, the money that you make is yours to keep but it's just a way for us to be in the community. We'll be doing a free car wash as well for the community and having a barbecue. So lots of stuff happening, uh, but we hope that you'll be there for that day, whether you're uh, participating with the car wash or the yard sale. Regardless of that, come on by and just uh, meet the neighbors and just uh, let's uh, get to know them uh, better. And we'll be uh, advertising for Vacation Bible School as well. And that brings us to July to our Vacation Bible School which is July 8th to 12th, and we look forward to uh, just reaching our community once again uh, with the gospel and trying to bring some of these uh, children in. If you are planning to help, or if you've signed up prior, or you've told me before that you're planning to help with VBS, if you can still sign up on the bulletin board out there, I need a number of how many workers I have so I can start making the final uh, preparations uh, for the Vacation Bible School, so if you can help me out in that way. But I hope that you'll be in prayer for that as we approach that uh, that our church would make an impact and that we'd be able to reach families uh, with the gospel of Christ. So at this time, I'd ask the ushers if you can come forward as we prepare to take this morning's offering. And just a reminder, if you'd like to donate towards the Vacation Bible School, $10 would support one kid and help provide a t-shirt for them. So let's pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we're grateful uh, for uh, your faithfulness in our lives, Lord, and the blessings that you bestow upon us. And Lord, I pray now as we worship you with the giving of our tithes and offerings, that Lord, you just take this offering, bless the giver, and Lord, I pray that we'd use it for the furtherance of your gospel. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. <laughs>
So all stand up, please, and let's sing, I'd rather have Jesus. And now, kids 12 and under are dismissed for our children's church. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by His nails pierced than to be the of a vast domain and be held in sin's way. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a past. Let's sing the chorus a cappella. Then to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sickness way. I'd rather have Jesus than anything is worth. Let's sing the chorus again. A cappella. Than to be our king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread way. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords to. Acts chapter number 6, here this morning, on a beautiful morning, a little cool to start off, but that sunshine's out there, encouraging, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, let me just encourage you, if you're thinking about helping out in VBS, just do it, okay? Pastor Matt needs to help, he didn't ask me to say this, I'm just telling you. Serve together. Uh, so if you got any time at all, if you can fit into uh, the schedule there, I know it would be a wonderful thing. And uh, we saw dozens of kids last year come from the also impacting them with the gospel. And that's what we want to do here at Legacy Baptist Church, amen? We want to make an impact with the gospel. So great opportunity for that. Uh, and this week coming up, we are going to send off the money we've raised for Air Steel. And so if you want to give towards that, uh, this do it before Thursday. We're going to send it off to her on Thursday. That's the plan. Uh, we've raised just over $600. I haven't seen the latest numbers, but just over that. Uh, so if you want to give some more towards her to help her out down there with her mission work in the Caribbean, I know that she would be a great blessing. Uh, I, I can't remember. How much was that tin of peanut butter again, Lynn?
So I'm not so fine of uh, pomegranates, but peanut butter, 15 bucks for a jar of it, that, that's pretty expensive in my mind. But at any rate, if you can uh, help her out at all, just pass it on through the church and we'll get it to her. Uh, so I know she, it would be a blessing to her. Blessing that she could buy more groceries, but a blessing to know that a church family cares about her. Okay, that's the big one, that we care. And I hope you're praying for her as she's ministering down there. I know she could use the prayers. And I want to let you know just before we dive into some prayer requests uh, that I'm, I'm going to be away for the next uh, 12 or so days. Uh, coming up this week, I'm heading out east, uh, helping out some family with some con uh, construction work. My dad's the construction worker, but he's 70 now, and the back says it's 70. And so he looks at me and says, oh, you have a back that's 47. You can help me. So uh, me and my son Matthew are going to be helping out with him this uh, coming up uh, once we get out there and things. Uh, so I'd ask you to pray for us. Uh, a lot of my family's not saved, and I want to be able to have an opportunity to give them the gospel again. I'm thankful for parents who've been very faithful in, in sowing the seed. Maybe I can do some watering and things of that nature. So I would appreciate your prayers on that behalf, safety and travel, and in construction, okay? You never know me and tools, okay? You never know what's going to happen, but... I would appreciate that. Uh, just as we dive into prayer, uh, I got a letter from uh, Dr. Thiessen uh, asking us to pray for Crossway Baptist Church in Windsor. They're having what's called Hope for Windsor campaign. So they put out flyers, put up signs in their, on their members' uh, properties and talking about Hope for Windsor. And the Hope for Windsor is Jesus. All right. So they're pointing the community towards the Lord. He's doing a lot of traveling in southern Ontario, Ohio, and North Carolina in the next couple months. So I ask for traveling mercies. And then in November, he's heading over to India, as long as things uh, continue to be calm, uh, diplomatically, politically. Uh, so let's be in prayer for him as he does that. And then let's be praying for our high school students and all our students, particularly our high school students. They're getting close to being finished. You know you're getting close because they come into church and they're smiling. <laughs> School's almost done. Yay, you know, type of thing. But uh, let's be in prayer for them. Let's pray for them as they study their exams and that they would do their best. That's the most important thing, to do your best, and we'll be praying for you as a church family. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for this Sunday. Thank you for giving us another Sunday in nice weather outside. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would be in tune with you, and Lord, that the message would be encouragement. Lord, I pray for Dr. Thiessen. Thank you for him and his ministry and uh, founding this church, and Lord, you moving him into missions work now, Lord, I pray that you would encourage him and his family, uh, Lord, protect them as they travel, and uh, different in the campaign there in Windsor, help them to be a great encouragement, and pray for that church there, uh, they could see a fruit from that effort, pray for uh, him as he ministers to folks in different venues online as well, I pray, Lord, that you would give him the strength he needs, Lord, thank you for him and his friendship, Lord, I thank you for our High school students and all our students, but I think of them particularly as they're getting close to exams now. Lord, I pray that you help them to apply themselves well to the best of their abilities, to do their best in those exams. and Help to know that they are loved and they cared for in our church family. We're so thankful they're part of our church. Lord, I pray you watch over them. Give them a wisdom. Give them the strength they need. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, Acts chapter 6 and verse number 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should lead the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenes, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles, among the people, and then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of Libertines and Caesareans and Alexandrians and them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. 
Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemy words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false uh, witnesses, which said, This man ceased not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered on us, uh, delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Acts 6 and 7 really deal uh, with Stephen and his ministry and then his martyrdom in the next chapter. We're not going to look at that this morning. But he was a spirit-filled believer who was crowned by the Lord. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That's in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. He was faithful both in life and in death, and therefore he is a great example for us to, to look at, to follow, to uh, emulate in our own lives. Other godly men are mentioned in this passage, but the focus is absolutely on Stephen. And these are pivotal chapters in Acts concerning the church, and concerning what's going to take place. Uh, at this time, it's around three, three, uh, 33 or 34 AD. The Roman emperor Tiberius is on the throne and the choosing of Stephen and the six others take place. The church is growing. There's people getting baptized. It's multiplying. And that, we see that in the first uh, seven verses. Now, they, the scholars believe verse 8 takes place the following year of 34 A.D. So the, the deacons, we'll see this in a moment, are chosen. And then about a year later, we see Stephen is taken by the council. So first of all, Stephen the servant. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. The church is experiencing growing pains, okay, and is making it difficult for the apostles to minister to everybody. If we go back to the book of Acts, we'll see uh, the first five chapters. So many people have gotten saved. Thousands upon thousands have gotten saved. That's recorded. That's, and there's many more that got saved that we don't know about, numbers-wise. So it, the church is m rapidly increasing. Uh, the Cretans were Greek-speaking Jews who had come to Jerusalem from other nations. And they, they didn't speak Aramaic. That was the language that was spoken there. Uh, so these were Western uh, Jews or Hellenistic Jews or Grecians. There's a number of different terms that are interrelated uh, there. So in their culture, they're Western. And while the Hebrews were Jewish residents of the land who had never left, and, and they spoke Aramaic, that's not to say they didn't speak Greek, but their culture was Eastern the Hebrew culture. As the church attempted to meet the needs of the widows, the Grecian widows, so the, the ladies from that Western culture, are inadvertently neglected. I don't, we don't see anywhere that this was purposely done. It was inadvertently. And this caused a murmuring, okay, a murmuring amongst the Grecian Christians. So the word murmuring means complaining and grumbling. Complaining and grumbling. Now, this was the makings. I don't know if, if, if you have ever seen this before or heard of stories, but when murmuring and complaining and grumbling takes place in the church, that's a really good, uh, well, it's, not really, it's really bad, but it's a good setting for a split. Okay? Uh, that's, that's, that's often happens. And so people began to feel slighted by this. And people began to I mean, talk about, assume that this was favoritism by the leadership. The leadership did this on purpose. You know, whoever talking to the next person, did, you, know, you know they did this on purpose. Those apostles don't like us Grecians. They don't like where we're from. It's, it's super easy to see how that could happen in this situation. And you know, you know who's always looking for that? It's the enemy. The enemy is looking for every opportunity, and this is prime time real estate here when there's people grumbling and murmuring in the church for him to get in there and do pull out his tools and really give it a beating, really stir it all up to cultivate that spirit of, uh, of complaining and, and being opposing and rebellious towards uh, what God has laid out. And we need to make sure in our own lives, just a little pause thought here, we need to make sure in our own lives that we don't fall in that position either. All right, we're looking back a long time ago, but we need to make sure that we're not doing this 
today. Make sure that we are uh, being honest and taking care of things as they come into our lives. Thankfully, the apostles handled the problem with great wisdom and didn't give the enemy any foothold in the fellowship. And when a church faces a serious problem, this presents the leaders and the members with a number, we, we, we often use the word challenges, but I think a good word in a lot of cases is opportunities. Gives us opportunities. For one thing, the problem gives the opportunity for the leadership to examine the ministry, to sit back and say, okay, there's there something that needs to be changed. Is there, is there an adjustment that needs to be made? In times of success, it's easy for a church to maintain the status quo. Okay, just, oh, we're doing great. We don't need to change. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this again later. I'm not talking about changing the message. All right? We're not talking about changing the doctrine, but there's things, and we're going to look at them in a moment, that can help a church do more. Help the fellowship do, do better. So it's, it's dangerous to get in the mindset that we've done it this way forever. This is the best way. Hey, this, you know, a lot of business models, they fail in that realm. Hey, as Christians, we need to look at it and say, okay, we're not a church, the church is not a business, but the idea is that what can we do to have a bigger impact? We need to look at that. How can we have a bigger impact for Jesus Christ? If you just automatically think that success will automatically come, you are on a destination called failure. No way. You, you might do okay, but you're not meeting, meeting the maximum potential. We must regularly examine our lives. You, you're going to tell me that you had a really good year in 2023 and you're not going to change anything for the rest of your life? That's a bad idea. So with the church, we had a great year, 2023, saw lots of folks come to the Lord and come to our church. Praise the Lord. But I'm not going to rest on 2023. I want to do better this year. You know, we've got to continuously look to the Lord. And the apostles studied the situation, and they concluded that this was partly their fault, that they were doing things here. They were so busy serving the tables that they neglected the prayer and the ministry of the Word of God. Uh, so they had created their own problem. And we do that a lot in our lives, don't we? As individuals, we create our own problems. Uh, so the reality is they're, you know, they're saying, we did this, so we need to change some things. Uh, folks, as the, I'm so thankful to be the pastor of Legacy Baptist Church. I love this church, but I definitely can't do everything. It's not possible. It'd be very unwise to attempt that. And if I'm not careful, I, can, I know myself, I can get uh, doing things, busy work, things that are good, there's no doubt about it, but it takes me away from the most important, and that's to be in the Word, to be in prayer. I don't know if you know this, but sermons just don't pop in my head Saturday night at 12.01. Okay? That's not how it operates. I'm spending all week. I'm just going to give you a little layout. On Sunday afternoons after we go home, I take a nap. I get, a, get some snoring in and cutting some timbers, you know, and then I wake up, and then I start thinking about the next message next Sunday. I'm already reading the scriptures for that next Sunday service, that next Sunday message. I know where I'm going, and I'm reading about it. I'm trying to saturate my mind with where the Lord has me going next in the message. It, it takes time, and uh, prayer takes time. You, you often uh, folks come to me and say, Pastor, can you pray about this? Yes, I will. Sometimes I pray with them right then, and other times I write it down, and I pray for them through the week, or as I'm about doing things in the week of uh, work. Just, oh, I need to pray for that. Someone came to mind this morning as I was randomly brushing my teeth. Someone popped in my head. I was like, you know what? I took out my phone and sent him a message. Hey, it's all part of my life, and I'm happy about it. This is, who, uh, this is, what, this is what the Lord's called me to do. But there's a lot of it. And I'm not suggesting that serving tables or cleaning up is a menial task that the apostles shouldn't have done, and that pastor shouldn't do today. Listen, I'll get in there with the grease monkeys as fast as anybody else. It's not a problem. But those, it's a matter of priorities, right? If I came next Sunday and was like, uh, yeah, my message is kind of stinky this week. I was busy scrubbing the toilets all week. You'd be like, what? Pastor, that's not what you're here for, and they're right to say that. But, I mean, could I help clean toilets? Sure. But the reality is there's a priority of and being in the Word. 
uh, a, a ministry leader many years ago said, used to say, it's better to put 10 men to work than to do the work of 10 men. Absolutely true. Get busy, get working. I think of Moses' father-in-law uh, when he told me, he said, you can't judge all these people. I just recently read that in my devotions about how his father-in-law, uh, and father-in-laws are good for this, they'll, they'll abruptly tell you, right? Amen, father-in-laws? You abruptly tell the, the son-in-law what's going on. And he, he shows, feel, I feel like when I read that scripture, he shows up and says, what are you doing, Moses? You can't take care of all these people the way you're doing it. He was exhausted from all the matters that were coming before him. He says, you need a system. You need to get this guy to take care of this many. You need a guy to take care of this many. He's prioritizing his time. He said, you have a very important job, and these things can be given to faithful men. That's what's taking place here. Uh, the church uh, was not afraid here in Acts to adjust their structure in order to make room for growing ministry, for greater impact. And, and when a structure and ministry conflicts, there you know you need to sit down and say, okay, well, Lord, what do you want us to do? What 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 has to happen here? It, it's sad when churches will just stay in the same rut forever. And again, I'm going to say it again. I'm not talking about changing the doctrine. Amen. The truth is the truth is the truth. It always will be, but we can change our structure in a sense of making modifications in reaching the, our community. I think of the summer of 2022. We're out of that dreaded time of COVID, you know, and I had missed everyone in church like crazy. And I remember sitting down with Pastor Matt that spring. It's like, you know what, Pastor Matt, we are going to do outdoor services. We're going to get out in the backyard, and we're going to have a great time. And all that summer, we're just going to have 9 and 11 a.m. services, and just so we can be together, and we ate a lot of food that summer. We did. I still have good memories of that summer. All right. And I remember after the first service, Brother Rodrigo comes up to me and goes, Pastor, he didn't know I was going to mention his name. He says, we need to do this all the time. And I looked at him like, what? All the we can't be out here. I actually, I think I said this to We can't be out here in the winter time. That's not going to work. It gets cold in Canada. You know, that's, that, that's what came to my mind. And he's like, no, Pastor. This. And we talked about it for a while. And then it, I, I don't think Rodrigo went and talked to other people. But other people came and talked to me. I'm like, Pastor, this is a really encouraging. This is really good. This is really helpful. So we modified in our own church. We changed our structure to help us in our own congregation, our own fellowship. We didn't do anything wrong, amen? The Word of God doesn't tell us thou must have a service at 9 and at 5. It does not say that. It tells us to get together, amen, to assemble. But we, we, we changed that up. And I'm going to tell you right now, I've seen so many good things come out of that. It wasn't my goal when I did that summer uh, backyards for that, but I saw... Uh, a huge increase. Uh, I've I seen so many good things, and, I, and I was, I'll be honest, I was having a hard time in my own mind going from that to 9-11 all the time. He's, I was always used to 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock or whatever in the evening. And I remember one day I saw a, a dear man I, in our church helping out a younger brother who I knew was having a hard time, and I saw him say, hey, let's go to Tim Hortons. And we'll come back for service. Let's, let's talk. I was like, that's it. That's what church is all about, amen? I preach the word. We encourage one another. We help ourselves, uh, each other down the, the, the journey of life, the Christian life, with the Lord guiding us absolutely. But this is what's taking place here. There's a modification taking place. I was talking to a pastor friend this week about this, and he told me that he knew of a, of a pastor, a church planner in Hong Kong, who would have his services. You think 9 a.m. is early? It is early. This guy started at 7. He did 7 for the sole purpose because he was reaching a multitude of nationalities, primarily Filipino, but who were servants or maids or whatever in homes, and that's when they had time off. Mmm, modification. Hey, I need to change some things. He could have had service at 9 and no one show up, but I'm doing 9. No, do seven. You have a greater impact, amen? That's, but that's how we have to think in our own lives, our church life. We want to have the best imp impact we can. Problems also give us the opportunity to express our love 
uh, the Hebrew leaders and the predominantly Hebrew members selected six men who were Grecian. So these were Jewish men who were from the Western culture. And then they picked one who was a Gentile. And he became a proselyte. And then he became he accepted Christ as his own personal Lord and Savior. They were showing love. They're like, the, the Grecian widows feel that they're being slighted. We're going to get Grecian men. They understand the culture. They can help them better than us because we don't understand all that. We are going to have these men serve the tables. And there's still going to be Hebrew widows there too, like from Jerusalem and Israel. But we're going to choose this. The, the church solved the problem. And they weren't thinking of themselves. They were thinking of others. There are others that need to be addressed. And we commonly refer to these seven men as deacons. That title is not given them in this chapter. You'll find the deacons mentioned in Philippians chapter 1, uh, verse 1, and then in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 to 13, we get the, the qualifications. The word simply here is a servant. They're serving, and that's what the deacon means. And so they're not specifically called deacon, but they're doing the work of a deacon. If, if you, I think if you want to be really technical, you probably could call them the proto-deacons, the, the earliest form of a deacon here, okay? The New Testament deacons were appointed by the church to assist the spiritual leadership. In no case were the deacons the ruling board of the church. This is not what's taking place here. Absolutely not. The word board in the sense of an oversight committee does not appear anywhere in the Bible. That's not a biblical mind frame or a principle. We have seen that they had to have an honest report. That means they had to be witnessed. People saw who they were. And they were you know, folks or men who served the Lord, who loved the Lord and did what was right. They, they had to have a good report, full of the Holy Ghost is mentioned. That's a spiritual qualification, full of wisdom, skilled, wise men. And these men were appointed over the business this word means necessity, duty, or need. That's what they're put over. They, they're going to take care of these things. It doesn't mean that the deacons are to take charge of the business of all the church. Rather, they're appointed to deal with the necessary needs or problems that they can help with. Uh, their job is to take some of the load from the spiritual leadership and, and enabling them to focus more on the spiritual needs. You know, when someone phones me uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, it's happened and they have a, a, a spiritual need, I don't say, no, just hold on. I, I got Dave Legaspi on speed dial. He'll help you. Have a good night. Click. Dave's happy I don't do that. <laughs> no, that's, that's my job. Now, if I need help from Dave, I'll ask. Probably wait till 6. But, you know, that... It's my job. That, that, that falls well within my realm of ministry, my, my realm that I need to be involved with. But they're there to help me. They help me with many other things. I grew up in a church uh, in Newfoundland. We had solid deacons. And, you know, where I grew up, you can almost see the end of the world, right? Like, it's just over there. It's really close. So it's not a place that a lot of people, pastors, want to go and live because... It's on the end of the world. The weather's not very good, and they don't, probably don't understand what we're all saying all the time either because our accents or dialects are interesting. But we would see pastors come and go quite frequently. And sometimes there was a number of years in between pastors. And I was so thankful for our deacons that they had some abilities to preach and to teach, and they would do that. But as soon as a, a new pastor was found, they're like, oh, it's all yours. We, we don't want anything to do with that, that you're here. We'll help you. It's all yours. I'm thankful for our deacons in our church, our Vic, Mark, Manny, and David. They helped me immensely, and they serve the church. They love the church. They, they speak to me often about the church. Should we do this, Pastor? Should we do this? How can I help you, Pastor? Uh, I haven't seen this person now for a while. I'm going to reach out to them, Pastor. We have good deacons. And I'm thankful for them. And uh, um, maybe a good little pack, pat in the back would be, uh, you know, we need to encourage one another. Provoke on the good works? Uh, you can provoke our deacons on the good works. They're not bad. But we all need encouragement. Every one of us. We all need it. 
The seven men were chosen by the church. Each of them had a Greek name, again, showing their Grecian Hellenistic Jews. Um, and, and again, there will be absolutely no question about fairness to the Grecian widows. That shows wisdom, doesn't it? And that shows wisdom. That wasn't the apostles who did that. The apostles said to the church, church, find you some men who will help the widows. And the church, it was a challenge, but they said, no, 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 it's not a challenge. It's an opportunity to demonstrate wisdom and to apply it. The church was strengthened. Just a few verses before, it looked like the church could split. Now it's strengthened. Now it's going forward. So a quick word about these seven servants. The seven servants, so Stephen, obviously we're looking at him in just a moment here and in in future uh, chapter. His name means a wreath or crown. Philip, his name is warrior, meaning is warrior or lover of horses. He would go on to have a huge ministry in Samaria. Great numbers came to Christ during his preaching uh, itinerary there in Samaria. He would be used to assist bringing the gospel to Africa, to the south. He started church in Caesarea. And we'll look at his life in the weeks ahead, the Lord willing. Prochorus, uh, leading, his name means leading a chorus, dance or leader of singers. And the next, the, the remainder of the information I'm going to give is just, I found on church history, or this is what they think took place. It's not absolute gospel, and since we absolutely know this took place, but this is what was thought. It's thought that he traveled with Peter on preaching journeys after uh, being uh, ordained as a deacon. Nicanor is a conqueror. His name means conqueror or victorious. Uh, he was martyred for the faith in 76 A.D. Timnon, uh, honorable, deemed worthy. Sometime after being a, becoming a deacon, he would go to Syria to preach the gospel. And the pagans in Syria hated him for preaching the gospel, and they burnt him to death. He became a martyr. Uh, Parmaeus, faithful, or I abide. Uh, During the Roman emperor Trajan, he really hated Christians, like really hated them. And he brought severe persecution to the Christians, and he was martyred during one of the persecutions during the emperor Trajan's rule. And then Nicholas, uh, conqueror of the people. So he was a pagan who converted to Judaism, and then he heard about Jesus and said, well, Judaism isn't it. Christianity, following Christ, is it? So that's what took place. I don't have any other information about him besides what we know, that he came from pagan, Judaism, then Christianity. The emphasis is Stephen's life now, the fullness. He was full of the Holy Ghost. He was following what the Lord wanted to him. And what we see, the... the, uh, the qualifications full of Holy Ghost and wisdom who may appoint over this business. That's in verse uh, number 3. So he, he's following the Lord, uh, and full of faith, full of power. Uh, to be full of, in the context that we're looking at, means to be controlled by. The full of means to be controlled by. This man was controlled by the Spirit, by faith, wisdom, and power. He was a God-controlled man yielding to the Holy Spirit, a man who sought to lead others to Christ. He was active in it. He took care of the tables. He, he was serving the widows, but at the same time, he was preaching. He was, a, he was an evangelist. And we see the church is growing. It's just going forward. Things are Good things are happening. Verse 7, and the word of God increased. So this is after the seven men have been chosen. The word of God increased, and a number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. So the church is unified, it's going forward. Again, a few verses before, the murmuring, the complaining was taking place. That's all, that's all forgotten now. Now we're going forward, we're strengthened, and they're magnifying. And verse 7, that I just read, is like a summary statement uh, of the church, and these summary statements are found throughout uh, the book of Acts, like five or six times for short, just kind of talking about what, how the church is. It's not talking about anybody in particular, but just the church in general. So in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, is really the climax of the ministry in Jerusalem. This is the height it reaches. For the persecution that's soon going to follow, because we're not, we're not going to look at chapter 7, Today, this morning, 
But the persecution begins after Stephen is stoned. The, the, the tables are turned, you could say. So this is the height of it. And, and then the gospel then leaves Jerusalem, goes into Samaria, and then out to further into the Gentiles again. So a massive change is about to take place for the church. So just a little side note. It's interesting. It mentions in this summary statement, a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. So it's thought by scholars that there was about 8,000 Jewish priests attached to the temple ministry in Jerusalem. That's a lot of people, 8,000. And then it tells us that a great company of them trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, how did the priest hear about Jesus? Oh, yeah, the church met at the temple, right? That's where it was meeting and preaching up until this point. And after this, then it's dispersion. But for about three years now, the church has been meeting at the temple's gates, the steps, and preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. And the priests heard it, and a great company got saved. Verse number 8, down at the end of the chapter, we see Stephen the witness. Stephen the witness. Spiritful man, didn't limit himself to the ministry of the tables. He did do that as he was called to do, but he was active. And then Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. I mean, he was, he was busy. Now, he's one of the few that God used who was outside the apostleship for miracles. He was a rare you know, case. Not too many others were in that ability to perform miracles. But God had given him the power to do so, and he was being a faithful witness to the people, to those around him. And his, his testimony was powerful. And if his testimony wasn't very powerful, I don't think the council would have been too concerned about him, don't you think? If he was a weak testimony, they'd be like, Pfft. But they had a problem with him because his testimony was powerful. It was convicting. So then we see uh, there's certain other synagogue that's called the Synagogue of Libertines, Caesareans, Alexandrians, uh, and uh, Cilicia of Asia. So Jews from many nations resided in Jerusalem. And in their own quarters, they had their own synagogue, their own place of worship, ethnic groups. The Libertines were considered free men. They were descended from Jews who had been captured and taken to Rome by the general Pompey. The Caesareans were uh, residents of Caesarea, which is a city on the coast of uh, North Africa located on modern-day Libya. It, it doesn't exist today as it was that day. Now, Alexandria was in the Nile in Egypt. There was a significant Jewish population in Alexandria. And it's, I believe Paul was part of that synagogue of the uh, Cilicia. This is highly possible because that's where he's from. It's highly possible that he debated Stephen. I don't see why not. He, he was trained by the best. You know, and they, everybody was having a go with Stephen. But nobody could match or resist his wisdom and power. Then they suborned men, which they said, verse 11, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him up and brought him into the council and set up false witnesses. There's some parallels between how the Jewish council here deals with Stephen and how they dealt with Jesus. First, they hired false witnesses to accuse him. They stirred up the people, and then they accused him of attacking the law of Moses. And finally, after listening to the witnesses, they executed him. They killed him. The Jews were very jealous over their law and couldn't understand how God, or sorry, Christ, had come to fulfill the law and to bring in a new age. They were proud of the temple, and they refused to believe that God would permit it to be destroyed. And Stephen faced that same spiritual blindness that Jeremiah faced in his ministry. You want to read about that in Jeremiah chapter 7. The church faced the opposition of the Jewish tradition for many years to come. From within its own ranks, we will see as we travel through the book of Acts that there will be false teachings sprout up, trying to hold on and bring in the Jewish tradition. And then from false teachers coming from outside in, in Galatians chapter 2 verse 4. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out your liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they may bring us into bondage. The enemy surprised Stephen. 
He was about the business of the Lord, telling people, witnessing, whatever. And they came upon him, and they caught him. And they took him. They dragged him into that council and tried him like they did Jesus and the apostles. It wasn't even necessary for Stephen to speak in order to give witness for the very glow of the Lord, like an angel was on his face. And isn't that something? They accused him of blaspheming Moses. Do you remember in the Old Testament there was a time when Moses had a glow on his face too? Listen, these men were supposed to be men of the Word and they knew the Old Testament. They would have known that there was a time when Moses had that same glow after being with God. Oh, there's some interesting parallels there, but they threw it all aside. It was as though God was saying, this man is not against Moses. He's like Moses. He's my faithful servant. You know, so just closing thoughts here, because we're not going to get into this trial of Stephen this morning. The church, up, the church is made up of people, right? And sometimes people, I know this is going to be a news flash to you, sometimes people are hard to deal with. And sometimes that's because people have been hurt. And they lash out. They lash out in that hurt. Sometimes it was uh, that they are hurt, but it was an innocent thing. It wasn't a purposeful action to hurt that person. And, and sometimes the person feels slighted when the other person doesn't even know it, that they slighted them. Whatever it is, and I don't know, but I'm sure there's someone here hurting about something. I mean, I get a couple people together, there's someone hurting about something. And, and I'm not downplaying your hurt. I'm not saying you shouldn't because we're human. We, we get hurt. Let, let me... Let me encourage you to apply wisdom when dealing with that problem. Don't let pride get in the way. Don't let pride say, no, I'm not going to talk to that person. They hurt me. I'm not talking to them. When I was about uh, 10, 11 years old, I had a newspaper route. And uh, if you've seen pictures of Newfoundland, it's pretty true. There's nowhere flat. All right, it's all hills. Up and down, up and down. So I was going up my paper route, and I fell down. It was like an icy time of the year. It was in the spring. I fell down, and I cut my knee open on the rocks that were uh, on the road. And uh, I cut my pants. But, you know, 10 to 11-year-old, no, we got to be tough. All my 10 to 11-year-olds are over in kids' church, so they're not going to give me an amen. But, you know, you got to be tough. And uh, a little bit of blood on my knee, like, yeah, I can walk this off. And I just, like, away I went. Well, a couple days later, I was like, man, my knee's hurting. What's that about? And I really didn't think anything else of it. And about a week or so later, I was like, and as a 10 or 11-year-old, you know, you're not really too up to date on making yourself smell good all the time, shall we say. And, but even now, I was like, something's smelly, and this ain't right. And I pulled up my pant leg, and it was a little green. And it smelled bad. And there was some white, goopy stuff coming out. And I remember going to my mom's like, hey, mom, look at this. And she's like, Mark, what did you do? Why didn't you come to me right away to get that taken care of? Do you know you could lose your leg? And you know how moms take it? Okay. She loves me, still does, and she was loving me then. You know, I have a scar still on my knee. I'm not going to show you. But, you know, if we don't take care of our problems, that's what can happen to us. It can get infected. And then we can infect other people with our speech. That murmuring and complaining I talked about earlier, that could happen. And, and why put off taking care of it? Don't do it to get a scar. Get it taken care of. Watch over it. Use some wisdom and speak of it. Get it taken care of. It's good for you and it's good for the church. Amen? It, it, I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't take long to know if there's problems with, between people. I've gone to churches and I'm like, hey, how are you? And I talk to this person over here and this person over here and this person. They don't talk and I didn't know about it. I remember one time I was trying to get them to shake hands. I thought they didn't know each other. Shaking hands did not happen, and I got some nasty looks. We need to work together. Amen?
we got a problem, let's talk about it, let's work out. And you know, at the end of the day, we still might disagree, but we're still part of the family of God. Now, I understand we got to separate from wrong doctrine. Yes, yes, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about things that get in our lives and slight just like these widows. All right? We need to watch out for that. Don't let that wound or offense to another fester get taken care of. We need to be filled, controlled by the Lord, like Stephen and those six other men. Let's make sure our relationship with the Savior is growing, it's flourishing. I, I love this time of year. All the flowers are coming out. All the vines around my house, they're growing like crazy. The flowers are coming. Don't ask me the names of the flowers. I have no idea. But I love the look of them. They look amazing. It's flourishing. It's growing. Is that your life with the Lord? You have that same thing taking place? You, you know, and for you to flourish and to grow, you need to spend time with the Lord. You need to be in His Word. You need to be communicating with Him in prayer. Those things need to take place if you're going to be flourishing. Be people of the book, Legacy Baptist Church. Be, be people of prayer. Put that time in to study and applying the truth. There is only one truth, and we have it in the Word of God. Apply it to your heart and mind. Our witness will not always be appreciated, but keep living for Jesus. Keep doing right. Keep pointing folks to Jesus. There's, there's going to be some uh, religious crowd that don't like what you say, right? Just like the council did with Stephen. But let me give you some hope. Before Stephen got taken away in that council, the Christian reached a whole bunch of religious people, didn't they? That great host of priests, that company of priests, they're religious and they were looking for the truth. There's lots of people looking for the truth. Let's make sure we keep up serving the Lord. Let's make sure we keep being that witness for Jesus Christ. Given the reason for our hope. Given the reason for our hope, and our hope is Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to ask you to please stand. Please stand as the piano begins to play. There's an invitation for you. The altar is open. Examine your heart and life. Are you promoting unity? Or are you on the grumbling side? Murmuring. We need to make sure our actions and our communication are encouraging and assisting in the unity of the local church, Legacy Baptist Church. If you have a problem with someone else, you need to get it taken care of. Don't let it fester. Don't leave it like that wound in my knee when I was 10, 11 years old. I got all crusty and smelly and horrible. Get it right with them now. Don't let, the, don't let it fester. Make the choice today to be controlled by the Lord. And let's continue to be faithful in our witness. Our city needs Jesus more than ever before. Dear Jesus, help us. Lord, help us to live for you. Help our witness to be one that points others to you. Help us in dealing with problems. Lord, help us to communicate with other believers. Help us to resolve. Help us not allow that problem, that offense, that slight to fester. But we bring it to them. We bring it to you. Lord, we need to be controlled by you. Help us each and every day to follow you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.